Uh, good afternoon. Uh, uh, on the East Coast, are you, are you able to hear me? Yes, we can, Professor Blackman. You're recognized. Thank you. Uh, I'm, uh, I was trying to get switched over to my laptop for a little better picture, but I'm going to uh, stick with the, uh, just doing this for my phone. My apologies if the picture's not as good as it could be, but thank you for having me uh, and for the invitation to, uh, uh, to, uh, to, to speak with you today. Um, I hope you'll forgive me, but I, uh, um, yeah, I'm sorry. I want to make sure I had the right remarks in front of me. Um, I'll, I'll uh, read from my, the remarks that I've already submitted first. And then if there are any questions that I can answer, I'm happy to do that. Sorry for the short delay. On July the 31st, 1903, a letter arrived written to President Theodore Roosevelt at the White House from a woman named Carrie Kinsey, a barely literate African-American woman in Bainbridge, Georgia, who, uh, whose 14-year-old brother, whose name was James Robinson, had been abducted a year earlier and sold to a plantation. Local police would take no interest in what had happened. She wrote in her letter, Mr. President, uh, they won't let me have him. He has not done nothing for them to have him in chains. So I, like the vast majority of such pleas, her letter was slipped into a small rectangular folder at the Department of Justice and tagged with a reference number. In this case, number 120074. No action in response was ever recorded. Her letter lies today in the National Archives. And again, I would note the date, 1903 of that letter. One might ask what relevance there could be to California and current legislative actions it could undertake in the sad story of a kidnapping in Georgia 118 years ago. No part of that incident occurred in California. There was no fault of the state of California in those events. No one could argue that one could argue that the entire question of racial discrimination against African Americans in the United States during that period was irrelevant somehow to California. There were fewer than 8,000 black people, barely half of 1% of the total population living in the entire state at the time of Kerry Kinsey's letter to President Roosevelt. Moreover, one might say, why would California consider legislation addressing the legacy of slavery, given that the American system of chattel enslavement was never legally enshrined in your state? which had existed as a part of the United States for fewer than 20 years at the time of slavery's abolition and the 13th Amendment. In my remarks today, I will offer some possible answers to those questions and share some of my findings after many years of attempting to understand how, how and why involuntary servitude continued to be a significant element of American life long after slavery's ostensible abolition and how the continuation of forced labor practices ultimately injured millions of black citizens and others in some parts of our country deep into the 20th century and continue to shape the contours of American life even today. First, I should quickly summarize uh, the history and narratives contained in my book and the subsequent documentary film, Slavery by Another Name, The Reenslavement of Black People in America from the Civil War to World War II. It, recount, it recounts how involuntary servitude was resurrected after the Civil War, first through the judicial system and then metastasizing through all of Southern society, how this system of what I call neo-slavery flourished with, with force and brutality in varying ways that circumscribed the lives of millions of African Americans deep into the 20th century and encouraged the spread of white supremacist beliefs and devastating racial discrimination by white Americans in every region of our country. That grim story unfolds through the experiences I documented of thousands of African Americans who experienced what became one of the most terrible chapters in the American history of abuse of its own citizens. The, the central figure in the, the central figure in my book is an obscure black man named Green Cottenham, who was born to two formerly enslaved African-Americans in a family that had spent generations on a cotton farm in central Alabama. Many of them descended from a man born in Africa in 1802 before being kidnapped into slavery and shipped across the Atlantic. 
On March 30th, 1908, Green Cottenham was arrested by the sheriff of Shelby County, Alabama, and charged with vagrancy. He had committed no true crime. Floyd was a new and flimsy concoction dredged up from legal obscurity at the end of the 19th century by the state legislatures of Alabama and other Southern states. It was capriciously enforced by local sheriffs and constables, adjudicated by mayors and notaries public, recorded haphazardly or not at all, and most tellingly in a time of massive unemployment among all Southern men, was reserved almost exclusively for black men. Cottenham's offense, his true offense, was that he was black. After three days behind bars, the 22-year-old man was found guilty in a swift appearance before the county judge and immediately sentenced to a 30-day term of hard labor. Unable to pay the fees assessed on every prisoner in those days, fees to the sheriff, the deputy, the court clerk, the witnesses who testified, Cottenham's sentence was extended to nearly a year of hard labor. The next day, he was sold under a standing arrangement between the county and a vast subsidiary of the Industrial North, U.S. Steel Corporation. The sheriff turned the young man over to the company for the duration of his sentence. In return, that company gave the county $12 a month to pay off Cottenham's fine and fees. What they did with Cottenham and thousands of other black men they purchased from sheriffs across Alabama was entirely up to them. A few hours later, he was plunged into the darkness of a mine called Slope Number 12, one, one shaft in a vast labyrinth on the edge of Birmingham known as the Pratt Mines. And there, as, as was the case with hundreds of other prisoners who had arrived under similar circumstances, he was treated with extraordinary brutality subjected to starvation conditions, almost no health care of any kind, and no assurance, no reasonable assurance that he would, in fact, ever be able to leave this place. The, it was a location where waves, <clears throat> where waves of disease ripped through the population. Uh, in the month before he arrived, pneumonia and tuberculosis had sickened dozens of other prisoners. Within his first four weeks, six died. Before the year was over, almost 60 men forced into slope number 12 were dead of disease, accidents, or homicide. Most of their broken bodies, along with hundreds of others before and after, were dumped into shallow graves scattered among the refuse of the mine. Others were incinerated in nearby ovens used to blast millions of tons of coal brought to the surface uh, and essential to U.S. Steel's production of iron. 45 years after President Abraham Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation, Green Cottenham and more than a thousand other black men toiled under the lash at slope number 12. Imprisoned in what was then the most advanced city of the South, guarded by whipping bosses employed by the most iconic example of the modern corporation, they were slaves in all but name. Cottenham became one of hundreds of thousands of African-Americans compelled into servitude through corrupt local courts, kidnapping, terror, and economic manipulation. Everywhere in the South, in the decades after the Civil War, whites resisted the full citizenship promised to formerly enslaved African-Americans and waged a relentless campaign to recreate economic systems that looked as close to slavery as possible. Sweeping laws were passed designed to criminalize Black life itself, used to intimidate black men away from political participation. Those who resisted were often compelled through the courts into slave mines or forced labor camps. Judges and sheriffs stole tens of thousands of black convicts, including huge numbers who had committed no true crimes, to corporate prison mines, quarries, timber camps, railroads, farms. They allowed their neighbors and political supporters to acquire still more laborers directly from their courtrooms. And as more and more African-American men and a smaller number of whites and African-American women were forced into labor in this way, the old business systems of slavery reappeared. Soon white thugs were patrolling the back roads of the South, seizing African-Americans and selling them to the highest bidders, 
often with no pretense of court involvement. In some isolated areas of the South, black families began to wonder out loud in letters that they wrote and sent to others decades after the Civil War, whether the old institutions of slavery had been officially reinstated. For a long time, American historians treated this aspect of our history cautiously. They largely accepted that what was written in the official records of these places was reliable, that in fact, the system of imprisonment may have been cruel, but that the people who were being held there were actually criminals, had committed actual injuries against society, deserved to be imprisoned even if the treatment that they received was too harsh. The belief was widespread that even though there were many indications of the innocence of thousands of these individuals, that there was really no way a century later to determine whether these convictions were legitimate or if these debts created by their convictions had been used to fraudulently entrap them in a new system of forced labor. What I found is I began to research this, and I want to be observant of the time and, and wrap up very quickly. Um, as I began to research this, I realized that, in fact, it was possible to probe deeply into the surviving records of local courts, small cities, counties, and rural areas, that there were places all over the South where the records of that period of time, in fact, remained abundant. And what I found in the course of of searching through what were ultimately millions of entries, certainly many hundreds of thousands of entries in that documentary record was a system of, a forced labor system of ruthless oppression and monotonous enormity. The, the, the arrests were on the basis of largely invented in crimes and crimes written specifically to intimidate African-Americans, such as changing employers without permission, vagrancy, walking along railroad lines, engaging in sexual activity or loud talk with white women. Uh, and, and the response from, from white Southerners uh, was to, were massive arrests over and over again, timed to correspond with the labor needs of either agriculture in the South or the growing industrial base of the South. I'm gonna stop from the, uh, and, and stop here in just a second. The other area that, uh, that if I had a little more time we could talk through and that's certainly worthy of, of examination is the degree to which that these practices and the ideas uh, which accompanied them and which were used to justify uh, these astonishing abuses of African Americans in the South, which is where the vast majority of the black population in the United States remained all the way through 1900. But these abuses uh, and the logic behind them as well as the economic injuries that they created for African-American families that, that continued to, to damage those families generation after generation, all of those injuries, all of, that, all of the terrible thinking that just, attempted to justify it in some way, were all elements of our culture and economic realities that then spread across the rest of the United States as both the African-American population and many others moved further and further to the West and in larger and larger numbers. And as I'm sure many of you are familiar, uh, it was also the case that while there had not been a substantial African-American population in what is now California prior to the Civil War or for several decades after that, it's still the case that through the peonage system, uh, which still existed and thrived in California and New Mexico and other areas uh, which had uh, been a part of Mexico prior to the uh, becoming a part of the United States, but the system of peonage, another form of forced labor and debt slavery, uh, which had been made illegal in the United States shortly after the Civil War, was also another vehicle of forced labor uh, that, in fact, uh, was was highly prevalent uh, in California and, and other parts of the West in that same period of time. And so while California is a place that, as you all know, of course, uh, slavery did not exist in the way that we understand it most commonly, uh, in the United States, the repercussions and the legacies of the damage that was done both by slavery before the Civil War and then these many generations of what constituted an apartheid system, uh, that, that, that all of these dimensions of the American economic system and the political system and the political repression uh, that was enforced through these economic abuses as well as mob violence and the other things that we're more familiar with, all of these forces uh, levered 
against the aspirations uh, and the abilities to pursue the American dream, to use the cliche uh, of African-Americans, both while they were in the South and as they, in, in subsequent generations, moved into other parts of, of America and in, including California. So, so I'll stop with my, my remarks right there, but, but with the final thought of it's, it's incredibly commendable that the legislature of California has taken upon itself, particularly given some of the background that I've just said, uh, to, to begin this examination and to look into this issue. And I, I hope that uh, I look forward to learning more about the, uh, the findings of your inquiry in the, in the months ahead. Thank you.